This is London's famous Westminster Abbey. Among the famous people honored here are three surgeons. John Hunter is buried here. A statue of his pupil, Sir Astley Cooper, is inside the main entrance. And Baron Joseph Lord Lister is honored with this bas-relief. Lister was born in Upton, now a suburb of London, uh, and he, the site of his birth is acknowledged with a memorial plaque. His father, Joseph Jackson Lister, was a scientist, a microscopist, and a member of the Royal Society. He also was a avowed Quaker, and because of the Quaker religion, uh, Joseph Lister enrolled at what was called the Godless University, University Hospital in London. The reason for that, instead of Oxford or Cambridge, is that it was required that admission to Oxford or Cambridge uh, brought with it an oath to follow the state church, uh, the Church of England. Uh, Lister qualified in 1852 and then was appointed to a position with Sir James Syme in Edinburgh. Now, the position that he was appointed to was called supernumerary, which uh, ad addressed the fact that there really wasn't a job there, but they made one for him because of his obvious talents. This was an seminal part of Lister's career in that he married his chief's daughter and left the Quaker church and joined the Anglican communion and in a sense probably became more of a part of British society by that particular move. In 1860 Lister received his first major academic appointment as Regis Professor of Surgery at Glasgow and there he noticed as he had in Edinburgh the uh, enormous human toll of amputation required because of hospital gangrene, because of infections of wounds, of compound fractures becoming infected. When he first uh, started to think about the problems of sepsis and hospital gangrene, as it was called in the terminology of the time, one of his uh, initial concerns was simply the smell. It was particularly appalling in the wards of the hospital in summertime, the place quite simply stank of rotting human flesh. It was distressing for the patients themselves, it was distressing for their visitors, for their relatives, who the moment they walked in got the impression this was a place where people came to die. It was distressing for the nursing staff, it was unpleasant for the medical staff. So one of Lister's first concerns was simply to suppress the bad odour. Now he had read that the municipal authorities in Carlisle had used carbolic acid on the sewage. They, the sewage in Carlisle was being used as a manure spread on the farm fields. And there were complaints about the appalling smell of untreated sewage being spread about. So the authorities treated the sewage with carbolic acid and that suppressed the uh, offensive aroma. So uh, carbolic first came into Lister's wards, first and foremost, as a means of suppressing the smell. So the crucial experiment, August the 12th, 1865, a date that shall be emblazoned on every operating theatre wall. The patient, a little boy called James Greenlee, is aged 11, who'd been knocked over by a wagon and came in with a compound tib and fib. Trivial injury, a little spiral fracture with a little spicule of bone coming out through a one and a half inch laceration. Sort of thing now you'd let the second year orthopedic resident get on with and do. It wasn't even done in an operating theatre. It was done in the two bedded side room off the main male surgical ward uh, in Lister's uh, 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 hospital. Lister very carefully mopped out the wound with undiluted carbolic. Took a large sheet of dressing, soaked it in carbolic, put it over the wound, splinted the wound very carefully. And he left that wound undisturbed for four days. Four days was the crucial experiment because Lister knew that every compound fracture in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, by four days, take the dressing down, the wound will be smelling to high heaven, suppurating, surrounding gangrene, patient desperately ill. On the fourth day, James Greenlees was a fit little boy, took the dressing down, wound was a little excoriated from the undiluted carbolic, but otherwise clean, and the child left hospital with both legs in situ 
on the, on the sixth week. Now, this painting that I've got is, was done by a, a modern American artist, and he's done it very accurately. He's got Lister beautifully portrayed. You can see he's holding Lister's sinus forceps. He's got the two-bedded side room, beautifully shown. The, the, the costume of the ward sister and the staff nurse, beautifully shown. Lister dressing the wound, very accurate. He's made one mistake. He's painted a healthy little American 11-year-old boy of about 1950-something, whereas in 1865, any little Glaswegian would have been scorbutic and rachitic and pediculotic and perhaps a little scrofulous as well. Now, when we talk about carbolic acid, we certainly should mention the man who discovered carbolic acid, a scientist of renown, today almost forgotten, Karl von Reichenbach, who was not only an industrialist, but who by that time already had discovered paraffin, which was a significant discovery as far as lighting is concerned, candles. And in 1830, described creosote. Now, this material from that time on was used as a very effective means of inhibiting putrefaction of wood, which was known to be caused by fungi. At that time already creosote was applied as the type of antibiotic of the period for treatment of various diseases and for many centuries up to our time was used, for example, as uh, filling uh, in uh, dental uh, surgery. And thereafter, he became aware of the theoretical basis behind the action of carbolic. He became aware of the uh, theoretical researches of Pasteur in France after he'd actually already begun to use an antiseptic agent. Ever since classical antiquity, surgeons had from time to time described tying off blood vessels with material taken from the intestines of sheep or goats, whatever it might have been. That material, of course, was catgut as we know it. In Lister's time, blood vessels were tied off with silk or cotton or other materials derived from fabric or sometimes even with metallic sutures. The ends had to be left very long because when infection occurred, one could take the end and pull it out of the wound. You didn't want to leave this and the wound is a foreign body. In 1868, only one year after Lister came across antisepsis, he remembered that catgut could be dissolved. It was called kit gut in his day because it was found in the strings of certain musical instruments called the kit that dancing masters used. He took kit gut, made carbolic acid solutions, put the kit gut into it and sure enough sterilized it. He tried many animal experiments. They worked. He began using it in patients and it worked very well there. It just didn't last a very long time. He realized, because he was a bit of a chemist, that he could permeate it with chromic salt. So what we had then was chromicized or chromic catgut. Chromic catgut and plain catgut continued unchanged until the more modern, more synthetic materials came along so they lasted a period of about 120 years exactly as he had created them and developed them just about the same time he discovered antisepsis. And that's an enormous contribution that we've forgotten and we really should remember about this great man. Another element was of uh, Lister's uh, feeling that we, after all, live in a septic world surrounded by... Uh, whatever elements are that cause infection. And therefore, when one of his residents uh, suggested to him that he apply a spray to remove all the bacteria in his surrounding and his operating room and so on, he may achieve his goal. This he did. This he did for a number of years, where he sprayed 
the room with this very smelly material and uh, uh, until uh, someone came and made the prophetic statement weg mit dem spray away with the spray and the spray was gone in 1865 lister was talking to thomas anderson who was the professor of chemistry and anderson told him about the fascinating publications in the french chemical literature by louis pasteur who had shown that the reason why milk and wine and urine go smelly and putrefy when exposed to the air is not the air, but the microbes in the air that produce these unpleasant changes. And we all know the classical experiments that, that uh, Pasteur would boil the milk, put a little plug of cotton wool in the mouth of the flask to prevent bacteria getting into the flask, but of course allowing air to permeate through the cotton wool and the the urine, the milk, the wine would remain sweet. The classical experiment of taking wine up to the top of Mont Blanc, exposing it to the pure bacteria-free air. It wasn't the air that produced the nasty, smelly changes. It's only when bacteria are introduced that these changes take place. There was a centennial celebration of the birth of the United States. Uh, it was much like a World's Fair. People came from all academic and cultural disciplines to make the statement of the progress of America during those 100 years. And among the contributions to that celebration was the International Medical Congress organized by Samuel Gross. And the highlighted speaker was Lord Lister. Now, while Gross uh, was skeptical of the work of Lister, as acknowledged in his diary in 1876, Gross came around, and uh, I think in the evolution of major concepts, a four-year time to absorb and accept is not anything for which we should extend much criticism. Among the preparations for the centennial celebration in 1876 was a production of art which hung and was displayed at the exhibition. In preparation for that, most likely, was the famous painting of Thomas Eakins done in 1875 entitled The Gross Clinic. The Gross Clinic is uh, arguably the most valuable American oil ever produced by an American artist. Uh, it shows Gross, though, in the old-fashioned surgical mode. He is standing above his patient with a business suit on, uh, he's wiping his hand, almost looks as if he's wiping his hands. He has blood on his hands, and there is a total absence of anything remarkably associated with aseptic technique. Fourteen years later, Thomas Easton produced his second great medical portrait entitled The Agnew Clinic. And the contrast between the two are striking. Agnew is portrayed in uh, the early type of surgical gown. There is no blood on his hands or in the operative field. There are masks available, and there is anesthesia given uh, through uh, an ether can in the, uh, in the portrait. The period 1876 uh, and Lister's long three-hour lecture describing his methodology had other influences which come down to us today. Robert Wood Johnson was in the audience, and he was more taken with Lister's concepts than perhaps many American surgeons. He determined that uh, he would uh, find a way to use Lister's concepts in the preparation of sterile dressings which could be packaged and which could be universally used. With his brothers, James Wood and Ed Lee Johnson, he founded the company in New Jersey, known to us today as Johnson & Johnson, whose motto is the most trusted name in dressings. There are a number of lessons to learn from the scientific breakthrough, observation, and evolution of concepts from Joseph Lister. This would be entitled today, a Translational Research. He took the literature that was evolving from Louis Pasteur, he applied it to practical experiments of his own, and then he moved it to the care and betterment of patients. Uh, Lister as a man was one almost above reproach. Uh, he worked with his wife Agnes in 
the laboratory. Uh, he was impeccable in his relationship with co-workers, fellow professionals, his patients, and probably the only criticism that could ever be levied at him is that he was not punctual. Like many chiefs, even a few to this day, uh, rounds started when Lister got there and everyone was supposed to be ready. In the last decades of his long life, Lister became heavy with honors, honorary degrees, titles, adulation from countries all over the world. But I think none of it meant as much to him as that great day, December 27th, 1892, when he represented the entire British medical establishment as well as the Royal Society of London and the Royal Society of Edinburgh at the 70th birthday celebration at the Sorbonne of Louis Pasteur. He was not only the representative of his country and of his country's science, but he came as the leading exponent in the entire world of Pasteur's theories. He delivered an eloquent talk in French, and toward the end he looked directly at Pasteur, who was sitting with him on the platform. When he was finished, Pasteur stood up and with help was brought to Lister. There's a very famous painting of this, which has certain inaccuracies. But in any event, what really happened was that Pasteur was able to shuffle over, threw his arms around the tall Lister, clutched him to his own bosom, and in the French way, kissed him on both cheeks. Well, eventually he was accepted in London. He was called in to drain the abscess of Queen Victoria in um, 1878. And a few years later, naturally enough, he was knighted in 83. Then he became the first Dr. Baron, and he, probably still the only doctor with a statue to his name around London. So many interesting points in his retirement, he was still called upon to uh, give opinions. One of the nicest stories, I think, was related to the coronation of uh, Edward VII because Treves had been called in to drain the um, king's abscess, or the future king's abscess, and the king had refused. He said the coronation couldn't be put off. So Treves naturally called in Lister, and Lister was a bit more forceful. He told the king that if he wanted to go to the abbey, it would be in a coffin unless he had his operation. And in fact, the coronation was put off for a short while, but he ended up just going to the abbey with a drain in. Uh, Treves naturally retired rapidly after this episode and went off and wrote The Elephant Man. I think surgeons today relate to Lister along the fashion that I described of his character and his capacity to translate laboratory observations into patient care. That is remarkably modern and almost unique in the 19th century to have that understanding of the value of basic science observations and their capacity to immediately be moved into the uh, forefront of patient care. And that, I think, is one of the big identities we all have with Lister today. Uh, another thing is his professional demeanor, uh, his uh, willingness to uh, accept the accolades that came his way gracefully at the same time pushing forward the substance of his concepts. And, uh, there's much to admire in Lister, and I think much that uh, we identify with him today and along those lines. To me, one of the most impressive things about Lister was a religious and spiritual sense, a belief that as physicians we are really doing God's work on earth. That never left him. The sense that we are gifted as physicians with this extraordinary opportunity to do things for our fellow man. And in the graduation address that he gave in the 1880s, he said this, it is our proud office to tend the fleshly tabernacle of the immortal spirit, and our path, if rightly followed, will be guided by unfettered truth and love unfeigned. In pursuit of this noble and holy calling, I wish you all Godspeed.